Hello, this is the fifth and last of a series of lectures on radiopharmaceutical dosimetry that were prepared under the IAA Tech Cooperation Program. And this is a project Paul 9025. So this lecture is entitled Software Tools for Clinical Dosimetry. I'm Manuel Bardiès. I'm working in the Institute of uh, Cancer Research in Montpellier in France. We've seen that scheme before, that's a general scheme and equation of nuclear medicine dosimetry that states that in a given situation, uh, we have to give account, take account of all the sources that contribute to the irradiation of a target K. So basically the absorbed dose in target K is the sum for all the sources H of a product of accumulated activity in the source H, which is basically the number of decay occurring in that source, multiplied by the factor S from the source to the target that gives how much of the energy emitted in the source is eventually absorbed in the target. So according to the mode formalism, that equation separates the absorbed dose calculation in two, in fact, three components. One is cumulated activity assessment, and that is quantitative imaging, time activity curve integration, so two independent steps. And the other one is the absorbed dose calculation itself, so the S value assessment. And global accuracy relies on both terms. So improving cumulated activity means improving S value assessment and vice versa. In fact, when we're looking further, a clinical dosimetry workflow, as what we could implement face to a request to implement dosimetry in a clinical environment goes much beyond that. Uh, in fact, clinical dosimetry workflow uh, is made of several steps and the absorbed dose calculation is just one part of a clinical dosimetry workflow. And all the parts or all the steps have to be dealt with in a relevant way. So you cannot favor one and forget the other. So these are all the steps. Uh, the first one is related to calibration acquisition before uh, making patient imaging, but that is going to grant you the possibility to have uh, activity assessment at the patient level. Then you've got patient data acquisition, then activity determination. That means reconstruction, for example, but also implementing the various correction that allows you to go from count detected in the image to activity uh, with scatter correction, attenuation correction, partial volume effect correction, and so on. Then registration and segmentation of the different images acquired at different time points after the administration of a radioactive drug. So you have to make sure that the images are uh, registered, and then you have to segment volume or region of interest that are interesting for you. It can be the kidney, or it can be the tumor, or it can be any, any, any other organ or tissue you're interested in. Then for that organ or that tissue, you have a time activity curve fit and cumulated activity assessment uh, and that is part of the D equal AS formula that we saw in the previous slide. And then there's the absorbed dose calculation that is D equal AS. So that's basically selecting the S and performing that uh, multiplication between accumulated activity and S value. Um, and then there's a presentation of the results. In the previous lecture, we've seen that sometimes just the absorbed dose as a a parameter is not sufficient to correlate with the um, efficacy or toxicity. For example, in the Novartis trial on yttrium 90 uh, that Tate um, radiopharmaceutical, we could see that uh, the BED was needed to give account of the toxicity to the kidney. So all these steps have to be implemented in the clinical uh, dosimetry workflow. And when we think of the different possibilities to implement them, 
we end up with two broad approaches that we've seen before. The first one is model-based and that's essentially used in the context of diagnostic dosimetry. And the second one is patient-specific assessment of the absorbed dose, and that's mostly in the context of therapy. So let me give you one example, and we discuss the results obtained with that example of clinical dosimetry. So this is an example of absorbed dose calculation using Olinda version 2. So Olinda is based on S values, but the S values in the version 2 are obtained from a voxel-based model. And the isotope used for that uh, theoretical example is lutetium-177. So it's a medium beta energy emitter and with some medium gamma emissions, but with a very low yield. So it means that the gamma contribution to the irradiation is going to be low. And uh, in the example, just for the sake of the lecture, uh, sources of liver, kidneys, and spleen. And this is a result obtained uh, from Olinda version two. So what I did is changing. So you've got the last uh, right columns that tell you uh, the percentage of uh, beta and gamma contribution to the irradiation of a given organ. So the first thing you can observe is that basically the largest absorbed dose delivered are coming from organs that are sources. So the kidney, the liver, and the spleen have got activity in it. And whenever an organ or a tissue has got activity in it, then the absorbed dose to that specific organ or tissue is going to be higher. And higher by, in that specific example, minimum one order of magnitude, which is a lot. All the others are well below, you know, uh, you have um, five, uh, 0.5 uh, I think it's probably milligray per, oops, sorry. Yeah, I don't have, I should put the uh, units. It's probably milligray per megabeck here. So second observation is that in that context, uh, in fact, it's mostly the beta contribution that contributes to the absorbed dose. You can see here that the beta contribution is over 90% for the source organ. And that is normal because for a medium beta energy uh, emitter, then the, the range of the electrons is very small, even uh, compared to um, a voxel size. So most of the energy emitted in every voxel is absorbed in the voxel itself. So that explains why uh, the absorbed dose from beta uh, is mostly coming from the beta component. And there are, this is due to the beta component, there, the rest is in fact target only organs. And you can see here that the irradiation in that situation in all the other organs is coming mostly and almost exclusively from the gamma component. So the first conclusion is that the absorbed dose delivered to target only organs is very low. Here you can see minus two, minus three, minus four as compared to minus one or zero uh, for source organs. And then it's almost exclusively gamma contribution. Okay, and with two exceptions. And the two exceptions are the adrenals that are irradiated by beta coming from, well, adrenal is coming from the kidney because the kidney, I mean, the adrenals are small and close to the, to the kidney. And this is a voxel-based model, okay? So you're likely to have voxels of adrenal that are next to voxel of kidney. And then the other example is lung and lungs get irradiated partly by the uh, electrons and beta emitted in the liver because liver is a source. But nonetheless, you can see that the irradiation is much lower for these target only organs than for the other source organs. So basically that, that, that indicates a lot. I mean, that situation of irradiation with a voxel based model tells us a lot for a given isotope on the uh, algorithm that should be implemented. Because as we can see, 
that, for example, with lutetium, most of the beta or electrons can be assumed to be locally absorbed, even at the voxel level. Rest obviously is not the case for the gamma. Uh, so choosing an approach or choosing an algorithm depends always on the relation between radiation range and special sampling of the geometry of the activity. Um, and obviously all this is assuming that we know the activity with a good enough accuracy. And that is something that I also discussed uh, a moment ago in, in a previous lecture, saying that I personally am still not convinced of the feasibility of voxel-based accumulated activity determination uh, when we have multiple time points. Whereas we can indeed perform absorb those calculations at the level of voxel if needed. So these are represented the three global radiation transport algorithm or the algorithm that can be implemented to compute the absorbed doses. Um, and so you've got local energy deposition that is very quick, but uh, is only possible if you assume that all the emitted energy is absorbed locally. Then you've got convolution. And as we've seen before, the convolution is mostly in homogeneous medium. And then you've got Monte Carlo. And Monte Carlo is going to be the gold standard, basically, because it can be, I mean, gives an exact or a solution for the absorbed dose calculation in heterogeneous medium. But then the penalty is in terms of computation speed um, because Monte Carlo codes takes a long time to run. So let's see all of them. Local energy deposition. I'm saying the degree zero of dosimetry, that's uh, very mean for me. But it, it, in fact, it means that honestly, if the activity is known with a special sampling that is superior to the radiation range, what's the point in propagating radiation? So you can effectively assume local energy deposition. In which case the determination of accumulated activity is sufficient to calculate the absorbed dose according to the equation that we've seen before. And that uh, mass adjustment that can be made uh, with a, a mass ratio for electrons or beta or a more complex adjustment for gamma, but only for self-absorbed dose uh, is implemented in different codes. So this is, for example, in Olinda, you've got the possibility in Olinda to modify the mass from the default mass of the model to the mass of your patient. For example, in Olinda, in the model implemented in Olinda version one, the kidneys are 300 grams, 299 grams, okay? If it happens that your patient has got a 400 gram kidneys, that is where you input that specific mass and then you do your calculation using that specific mass. And it gives you, as was uh, presented earlier, uh, an adjusted uh, absorbed dose calculation. So it's not fully patient specific, but at least an adjustment is performed for self-absorbed doses. But as we've just seen in the previous example with Olinda 2, the self-absorbed dose is quite often the most important contribution for any source. So, you know, maybe the, the cross contribution, uh, the fact that you cannot correct for cross contribution is not such a big deal after all. So it's only for self-absorbed dose, it's very important. Convolution. Well, suppose that you have an idea of absorbed dose deposition in a homogeneous medium from isotropic emission, which is a case of radioactive decay, then in homogeneous medium, the, you've got a curve that tells you the absorbed dose as a function to the distance to the source. And that is, or it can convert in the absorbed dose point kernel. So if you have accumulated activity or activity uh, sampled in 3D, you just do the convolution by the absorbed dose point kernel and you get an absorbed dose or absorbed dose rate distribution in 3D. And the calculation time can be optimized by the using of uh, Fourier transform, fast Fourier transform or fast Hartley transform. Uh, you can implement homemade calculation using, you know, in good old time MATLAB, now Python scripts. Um, and it's been even simplified by putting the dose point 
kernel under the form of voxel S values, meaning that you resample the dose point kernel with a special sampling of your activity. And that obviously facilitates the convolution. So the limits are homogeneous medium, water or soft tissue. And uh, even though some algorithm has been presented to overcome that limitation and to perform convolution in heterogeneous media. Then this is quite an old <coughs> um, figure from an article published in 1995 by Jap, and that was already presenting the convolution that you can obtain with a SPECT quantification and 3D map of activity. And then from uh, a dose point kernel obtained with Monte Carlo here, X4 or MERD. And then going in the space, in the Fourier space, performing the convolution. And then with the inverse fast Fourier transform, you get. So if you have an input of activity concentration as an output, you've got the absorbed dose rate. And then the same computing engine or the same software if you have accumulated activity as an input, then you will have an absorbed dose as an output. And uh, because, yeah, th th this was uh, proposed a long time ago, this is an example of voxel S values. So you can see it's resampling the absorbed dose point kernel to pass in a Cartesian geometry where you have uh, all everything de uh, defined for the voxel that have the same scale as the activity. Uh, and that was presented in MERT pamphlet 17, and in that situation computed with uh, Monte Carlo code X4. Um, and that gave birth to a range of homemade codes that allowed performing uh, clinical dosimetry. So this is a 3D ID proposed by the Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And with 3D ID, you will find easily the references. I think this was in 1993. Um, and you can see here the images of the anatomy, the CT, and the SPECT image. And you've got a fusion of the two and the convolution that was feasible uh, using uh, convolution of point kernels. Another example is RMDP from the Royal Marsden by Matt Guy. Uh, another more recent example is NUGDOS from uh, Michael Lassmann and colleagues from University of Würzburg in Germany. And all these codes, they implement convolution. And I'm not saying, uh, yeah, and because it's uh, easy also to do it. And it allows you to perform patient-specific dosimetry. The cost is obviously that you assume local, uh, you assume homogeneous uh, density. And that homogeneous density hypothesis is not, uh, I mean, it's fairly realistic. For example, if you want to compute the absorbed dose in uh, liver metastasis, in a context of uh, selective internal radiotherapy with yttrium 90 microspheres, as was presented here uh, by Giudoni et al. in 2013. So you have to the left uh, representation, a slice of uh, voxel S values uh, before the convolution. And uh, what is very interesting is when you look at the variation of a voxel S value, when you go from the central voxel 0.0, .0 one to the next voxel 0.02 or 0.03 the voxel after. And you can see the S value in uh, milligrade per megabec uh, second. And you can see that you have almost a factor 10 from one voxel to the next. That's how fast the absorbed dose decreases from the central voxel to its nearest neighbor. And what that indicates, it's even worse in the, in the case of iodine-131, but what that indicates is that if you're happy to make a 10% error, you can, you're not forced to even do the convolution. You can just perform uh, the calculation as if the energy was locally absorbed and that's going to be fine. And that raises the question of, you know, are you dealing with penetrating or non-penetrating radiations. Then Monte Carlo based dosimetry. So that's again, the gold standard. So you've got images, D0, D1, D3, an activity that is quantified with different corrections. And then you've got accumulated activity. Um, and then from the, the CT, you can segment different organs or regions. 
either automatic when the density difference between the organs and regions is important or manually. Then you, for a given uh, isotope, this is iodine 131, and for a given Monte Carlo code, you can do your calculation and obtain isodoses that you can superimpose on the anatomy. So that example using a code that is called uh, that was called a deep was applied in lipoiosis, which is uh, uh, I think it's no longer existing a treatment of a uh, very thick oil of a treatment of liver metastasis in uh, hepatocarcinoma. And um, in that example, in 2006, we can see that for a volume that is defined by uh, 194 by 140 by 90 voxel and voxels having two by two by four millimeter uh, side, the calculation at the organ level uh, with a, a, a variation, a statistical fluctuation, relative statistical fluctuation inferior to 2%, it took 45 minutes and it required four days to have a voxel-based calculation with a satisfactory statistics. So even at the time, it was fairly, fairly accessible, I would say. Uh, these are more recent examples. One is Ray Doz from the colleagues from uh, Velindra in Cardiff. And uh, that is really interesting because you can see the representation of anatomy and thanks to the absorbed dose rate calculation performed using Monte Carlo, it's a GN4 based calculation. Uh, you can have uh, absorbed dose volume histograms as you would in uh, external beam radiotherapy. Another example is VIDA. Again, it's not because it's uh, the best or it's because it's the oldest. This is actually a, quite a recent publication, uh, 2015 by Cost and colleagues, uh, including Mike Stabin. And I just selected that one because I, I, I like it highlights the fact that from the algorithm point of view, it doesn't really matter if you're performing voxel-based calculation for a model, as was done to the in the figure in the left, or as a real for a real patient, as is made for the figure to the bottom right. Right. So VIDA was applied to both uh, patient-specific dosimetry or model-based dosimetry. And that's fine. So that's model based, that's patient specific. Um, an interesting point is um, are we able to differentiate convolution versus Monte Carlo in that specific example? And the fact is that we can't, and we can't because this is a treatment of liver metastasis. So it's in homogeneous medium. So somehow in homogeneous medium, Monte Carlo calculation or convolution are going to give you exactly the same results. So, because it's homogeneous. Then, um, because we're talking of uh, patient-specific dosimetry, uh, I'd like to stress some, it's not a limit, but it's possibilities arising because we are in the context of therapy. The mode formalism as was uh, presented, so the D equal AS uh, equation here, was initially designed for diagnostic. And uh, it was a time where absorbed dose calculation was difficult to implement in clinical practice. I'm not saying that it's trivial these days, but it's certainly easier. But now in therapy, we aim for patient-specific dosimetry. So basically we do not need the calculation, the explicit calculation of the S value. The S value is something that is computed like the absorbed dose in a target per decay in a source uh, for several source target combination. You know, in the more recent uh, ICRP 110 model, because you've got more than 140 identified segmented uh, tissues, it means that you have more than 20,000 combination source to target. And so you're not going to compute all of them in the context of therapy. In the context of therapy, you will have an idea of your patient voxel based on the activity or cumulated activity, and you're going to compute straight the absorbed dose or absorbed dose rate. So you don't need S in a therapeutical context. But even more, I mean, you get the D equal AS with here, the cumulated activity. But uh, in fact, do we really need the cumulated activity? If we have accumulated activity, we'll get the absorbed dose. But we know that partially what conditions the response 
is the absorbed dose rate. So maybe we don't want to compute the absorbed dose directly using the accumulated activity, but we want to compute first the absorbed dose rate. So in that order, you, we have to extract and come back to the definition of the absorbed dose rate, uh, which is the equation at the bottom here. And uh, we may try to compute the absorbed dose rate first. So this is an alternate way of doing the calculation. What is normally done from time index patient images is to perform time integration, get the accumulated activity and compute once the absorbed doses. And that is um, something from the past where the calculation of the absorbed dose was so demanding and time consuming that you only wanted to do that calculation once. But nowadays, what is feasible from the same time index patient image is to compute the absorbed dose rates at different time point. So it means implementing the dosimetry step for the different time point and then compute the absorbed dose by integrating the absorbed dose rates. And that is interesting in the sense that it will allow you to measure the impact, if any, of the absorbed dose rate. And these two approaches are not necessarily equivalent because if you think of how difficult it can be to integrate, register and integrate images at the voxel level uh, when it's the activity at different time point, because the dosimetry somehow is like a smoothing, it allows you to think that maybe the time integration is going to be easier after the dosimetry calculation than before. Software, that's the, the core of this presentation. The good news is that software for clinical dosimetry exists. Then they can come in different flavors. First of all, first where the academic software, all the software designed and developed by research groups, including mine, but others, uh, we've been citing some of them already, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Royal Marsden. Uh, it seems that every academic team has developed its own software to do clinical dosimetry, just to answer the need they had. Then there are several questions raised by these academic software. The first one is their availability. Somehow, even if it's a friend of mine, if he's developing a software, but I don't have access to that software, from my point of view, it's as if it was not existing. Is it free? Is it maintained? Most of the software, most of the academic software, unfortunately, is lost when the student who developed it is gone. So is it maintained? Is it documented? Most of these are research tools. So somehow it's only the developer who's able to use it and he's got everything in his head. So he doesn't take the time to develop documentation. Uh, in my opinion, the only way of uh, maintaining and, and, and having a sort of sustainable development of software, uh, academic software, is to put that straight as an open source uh, software. And this is what is being done, for example, in the Open Dose 3D uh, project that I'm going to discuss later on. Aside of that, and it's more recent, we have commercial software. So commercial software, first of all, are expensive, all of them. Uh, so it doesn't really matter in which currency you're, you're paying, but it's going to cost you an arm. Uh, they are usually better documented, but honestly, having seen many of them, the documentation is still wanting. They usually are uh, sort of black boxes. So you, it's very difficult to know exactly what they're doing inside but they have a C marking or FDA clearance, meaning that they can be used in a clinical environment. It doesn't need to be a research uh, trial uh, to, to use it. Then the problem is how to compare, how to benchmark these codes. And coming back to the clinical dosimetry workflow, the fact is that all this soft, I mean, it's a, clinical dosimetry is a multiple step procedure. It's not just D equal AS. And these code and software, and I'm talking now of the commercial software mostly, uh, they address different parts of a clinical dosimetry workflow. So it's very difficult 
to compare them. Uh, some are treatment planning software, so they try to include everything. Some are just residence time determination software. So they do the quantitative imaging bit, but then they stop and tell, you know, use Olinda or use uh, S values. Um, and some are just absorb those calculation tools. So here's a presentation uh, based on the work of uh, a student of mine called Eric Mora Ramirez, uh, presented recently in medical physics. So you can see IDAC dose, which I mentioned earlier, is basically doing absorb dose calculation. Olinda version one or two, they're doing time activity curve fitting and absorb dose calculation, but it's model-based dosimetry, even though you can adjust the, the S value by the mass. Then software like Planet Dose, Stratos, Qdos, they use um, images, reconstructed images that allow you to perform registration and segmentation time activity curve fitting and absorb those calculation. Um, Hermes, some of the previous implementation of Hermes uh, and uh, MIM, they allow you to do also reconstruction. Um, and sometimes they go to the, to the absorb those calculation step or sometimes they do not depending on the uh, options that you've been uh, buying basically. And that's also the case for GE dosimetry toolkit. So, well, if you want to compare these different software, then it's difficult because again, they're not doing exactly the same thing. They're not doing the same steps in the clinical dosimetry workflow. So this is, uh, I mean, the good news is that if you try to take the same processing from the different software, whenever that is feasible, you end up with results that are pretty close. So here you, again, you got that comparison between dosimetry toolkit, uh, hybrid dose, so that's Hermes, Stratos, it's no longer existing as a software, Planet Dose from Dosisoft or MIM. And you can see that you have results that are pretty close between the different software. But again, this is hiding the fact that these software do, do not do the same thing. So, this is just uh, an example of, uh, you know, comparing this software, what they do, what they do not, and how they do it. And, um, and it's evolving. So it's uh, very difficult to, to make sure uh, how to do it. In fact, the comparison of software, uh, because the codes may address different parts of the dosimetry workflow. So first of all, we need to define the metrics to benchmark clinical dosimetry. For example, do we want to compare just average absorbed doses? Uh, maybe that's not going to be sufficient. Maybe we have to compare absorbed dose gradients. So we need to have those volume histograms uh, between the different software, if they can provide that. Um, then you have to define checkpoints in clinical dosimetry. Maybe we want to compare um, the activity at different time point or the accumulated activity or, you know, and at every stage of residence time and then the absorbed dose. So maybe we, we, we cannot compare the different software if we just compare the end result, which is the average absorbed dose. And, and, and this takes us quite um, uh, at a distance. I mean, so this is research where we believe that now the, the front line is to design digital test object that will specifically allow benchmarking clinical dosimetry codes. And this is one of the attempt that is ongoing within the open dose collaboration by a collaborator of mine. And that was presented in the ENM 2020 uh, by Alex Vergara Gil. And uh, he's been designing a dosimetry software which is open source called Open Dose 3D based on 3D Slicer. So I assume that most of you are familiar with 3D Slicer. Uh, 3D Slicer is a free open source software that runs on Linux, Macintosh, or Windows, and has extensible capability. So you can design plugin. And already that allows to do analysis, visualization of uh, medical imaging, um, meaning that you don't have to develop everything. You just have to basically use the cool features of 3D Slicer, that is DICOM RT, import, export, display, segmentation, registration, all that is already available. And then uh, my collaborator developed specifically, uh, well, 
first of all, the data workflow, but then time activity curve fitting and absorb dose or absorb dose rate calculation using local energy deposition convolution of Monte Carlo. And it's being developed uh, right now. And so this is just a quick view of a different uh, calculation. So uh, the kernels and those point kernels in water that are being used for the convolution, in addition to local energy deposition uh, based on ICRP 107 decay schemes, um, convolution kernel generated with gate version 8.2 and direct Monte Carlo calculation that is also present. So it's not built in, but within the code, you can generate the gate macro, uh, run them, and then it can import the results in, in, in the project. So as a summary, I mean, you've got two broad approaches to clinical dosimetry, patient-specific and model-based, and you've got several software, different tools are available to do that. Uh, Olinda, IDAC dose, our model-based dosimetry, then uh, vendor uh, software like uh, Planet Dose or MIM or even Hermes allow you to implement patient specific or you have open source codes like Open Dose 3D that allows also to do patient specific dosimetry. And uh, the selection mostly depends on the clinical application. And that's as always, you know, the clinical endpoint is going to condition the clinical dosimetry approach that you will have to implement. So the same sense true for the absorb dose algorithm that you need to implement between local energy deposition, convolution, Monte Carlo, there is not a unique answer. Again, it really depends on the clinical application. And in that situation, it depends on the relationship between radiation range and special sampling of the geometry. So to finish that last uh, uh, lecture, I would like to repeat that, in fact, what matters is that we document what we're doing in order to be able to ensure traceability of our results. Again, it doesn't really matter if we do not have the best equipment or the best you know, programmers or whatever to develop something specifically for our studies. Just do what you can with the available tools, with the available resources and time you have but document what you're doing. So like that, you'll be able to reprocess your data when you have more capabilities. And as a conclusion, there's a huge literature in absorb dose calculation. Uh, the methodology is there. Patient-specific dosimetry requires all the steps to be patient-specific. Uh, just D equal AS is just one step, but there are others. There are codes, academic or commercial, that implement these absorb dose calculation algorithm, meaning that it's doable in a clinical environment, but it's rapidly evolving. So it is uh, very interesting to see the progression of this domain. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, this concludes the last uh, of a series of five lectures on radiopharmaceutical dosimetry that was uh, made under the IAEA Technical Cooperation Program as a project, Paul 9025. Thank you very much. <laughs>